Perfect. She got it. All right. Uh, so that was just a little bit of uh, announcements, making sure we're all on the same page. All right. Uh, moving forward with our message, I actually, uh, as we're doing our series on Genesis, last week we covered the story of Adam and Eve, and last week I put up a picture that got a better reaction, honestly, than I was expecting it to, because I put up a picture involving a different Eve, as in the robot Eve. And I was amazed at the number of people who responded to these, these silly little robots that Disney and Pixar uh, created a handful of years ago. And so it really showed me just the power of a simple picture, uh, the way that it can help people connect to emotions and feelings, especially if it's something that they care about. Now, if you know Pixar, the creators of these characters, you know that they are the masters of getting you to care about things that really we should have no right caring about, but man, do they tell a fun story. Leave it to Pixar to make people fall in love with a cotton candy elephant named Bing Bong and cry when Bing Bong... Spoilers. <laughs> but arguably... Pixar has never done better than a love story that they told in 11 minutes. And I'd love to see your reaction when I simply show you this couple. Yeah, 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 that's what I expected. <laughs> it is amazing just how quickly a single picture can get your imagination going. In fact, if, if some of you are familiar enough with this, you might know most of this section is completely uh, nonverbal. It plays out as just a, a musical track, and you could probably even hear that track. Even if you, you don't know what they're saying, some of you might be able to hear this picture. Believe it or not, I bet you some of you are, know this idea with another picture. You may not know exactly what's happening, but can you hear this picture? There we go, different generation. I got some different people. You, you know what it is. <laughs> I'm not going to ask any of you to sing it. <laughs> I'm kind of curious just how far we can take this, though. Is there anybody here who can hear this picture? This is not sung. It's simply spoken, four words. And what are those words that this picture is saying? Wax on, wax off. <laughs> Newer generations may not know this version, but they may be more familiar with this version, the one with Jackie Chan in the place of Mr. Miyagi and then Will Smith's son uh, playing the, the young karate kid. Uh, this version did not use car wax. This version used a little bit different of an illustration, and their phrase is jacket on, jacket off. Because what happens in the new version is simply the process of teaching this little boy to respect his stuff. And so he spends a week, a thousand times, doing nothing while he's with Jackie Chan except learning how to take off his jacket, how to put it down, how to pick it up, how to hang it up, how to put it back on. And he does this a thousand times, over and over and over again. Jack it on, jack it off. Until finally one day, the boy has had enough. And the boy decides, that's it, I can't do this anymore, I quit. You don't know Kung Fu. And Jackie Chan immediately stops the boy and says, hey you. And the kid, politely enough, stops. And he says, do it again. Jacket on, jacket off. And so he, the boy goes to do this. Jackie Chan rips the jacket out of his hands, throws it behind him, and says, jacket on. He's like, but I don't have a jacket on. And the boy goes like this. And when the boy goes like this, Jackie Chan freezes him and actually shows him that this process is putting up a guard. This process is blocking a multiple attack. Pick it up, how to block a kick. Hang it up, how to attack. And next thing you know, Jackie Chan, using these phrases, jack it on, jack it off, pick it up, playing it up. He then goes full Jackie Chan on this kid who is blocking and doing all of these maneuvers. And his point is, everything is kung fu. 
<laughs> Same process with wax on, wax off, if you're familiar with it, by the way. You might not know what you're doing, why you're doing it, but under the hands of a skilled teacher, you may learn a lesson that has bigger consequences than what you were initially experiencing. And that leads us to today's message. It's the story of a guy who needed to become stronger. We are dealing with the story of Noah today as we continue through our series on the book of Genesis. We are going to learn about a man who went through a journey because God needed him to be stronger. What did he do? How did he do it? And most importantly, why? Well, here's your why. Did you realize it's not about Noah? It's not about Adam and Eve? It's not about Abraham next week or Joseph in three weeks or whatever? These characters all teach us something about God. And what they go through to discover God, who he is, can also help us to better know God through what we're going through to get to know who he is. So today's lesson, today's why, Noah was trying to build a boat. God wanted to build something better. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity we have to be able to gather together, to sing your praises, to tell stories of your goodness, and to open your scriptures. I pray that you would speak to us and help us to listen and discover how everything could be a chance to, to become stronger in our faith for you. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as I mentioned, we are doing a series on Genesis. We are, of course, in our third major story into the series. Uh, we go back a couple of weeks, and we find this simply put, God created everything. And what is the word, one word that is used to describe how everything was created? It was good. And it is amazing how quickly things can go from good, and in fact, once he brings Adam and Eve into the story, very good, but we can see just how quickly things can go from good and very good to not so good and worse and worse. We've, of course, skipped over the story of Cain and Abel. We've skipped over the story of Lamech, the first polyg uh, polygamy, polygamous man in, in Scripture. We've, script, we've, we've shifted over a handful of generations of descendants of Adam and Eve, and we now find ourselves at a point where humanity has gone from good and very good to not good to bad. In fact, there's a, there's a word that we find in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 that describes perfectly the state that we now find humanity in. In Genesis 6 and verse 5, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. What a shame to see how far they've, they've fallen, but unfortunately, isn't this what they bought in the first place? Think about Adam and Eve. Think about the temptation. Bite from the fruit, and you will know, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And we were told that in the beginning they were good, that they were exposed to good. And Satan sold, trying to sell them something that they had in order to give them something that they were never supposed to have. Well, here's the fruit of their, of their decisions. Everything has now turned evil. And my translation, the New Living Translation, I found, so the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. That line right there caught me. It broke his heart to see just how far we had fallen from him, how far we turned our backs on him. And it gets to a point where God now says, that's it, I'm done. I'm getting rid of these humans. I have to admit, we've experienced a little bit of tragedy in the not-too-distant past. You know the stories of our puppy dogs. Puppy dogs have been great, and puppies have been cute. <sighs> puppies are playful. Puppies are restless. P 
Puppies are puppies. Oh, puppies are evil because he knows what comes next. The puppies killed one of our chickens. And I'll tell you, through the tears, through the heartbreak, through the devastation of this past week, one of the things that I heard from a handful of my children was, we just need to get rid of the puppies. They are experiencing on a very small scale what God has now watched generation after generation after generation of human go through. And he decides, that's it, we just need to get rid of those puppies, I mean humans. But then God's love struck. It struck in the beginning, that's why creation happened in the first place. And it struck again when he looked out at those awful humans and he saw Noah. Noah found favor with the Lord. Literally, Hebrew is hen. Uh, literally, the word means grace. This is our first use of the word grace. First use of almost 70 times in the Old Testament. He found favor with the Lord. And that story then becomes uh, one of these stories that honestly, if you're aware of my, my story, my journey from atheist to Christian, atheist Mike knew the story of Noah. I was at least passingly familiar with what Noah went through. Uh, whole new generations of people recently were exposed to the story of Noah, though not perhaps as biblically as we would have liked when they made a major Hollywood video and it included things like rock monsters. I hope everybody who saw that movie was inspired to know that the book is always better than the movie. But we have this story, which is a famous story for so many people. Noah is told to build a boat. He builds a boat, gets on the boat, him and his family and animals, lots and lots of animals. The floods come, the floods go, and they walk off. Right? That's the story. It's actually interesting. If you think about it from a very basic perspective, when you put it that way, it actually has what is noted as a chiastic structure. They build the boat, they load the boat, the waters come, the waters go, they unload the boat. Noah builds an altar for sacrifice. If you remember our discussions on chiastic structures from back in the fall, you might remember that the climax, the central point of the chiasm is the most important part of that chiasm. It is the most important thing that we are supposed to know. And what's interesting here is the most important part of the story happens while Noah is actually floating on the waters. In Genesis chapter 8 and verse 1, we actually find the climax. It's the first sentence of Genesis 8-1. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and livestock with him on the boat. This is the most important sentence of the entire story of the book of Noah, the way that Moses has written it. God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and all the livestock with him in the boat. Let's talk for a second about what it means to be in a boat. And even more basically, <laughs> simple question. While he's floating on those waters, what do you think Noah was thankful for as the, the floods are happening? What saved Noah from the flood? Ah, you guys got it right. So many people got it right. That is right. It is easy to think that the ark that he was floating on, that that's what he's thankful for. But no, the ark didn't save Noah. You said it. God did. That's right. Interestingly enough, the word for ark here is not the common Hebrew word for boat. This word is only used one other place elsewhere in Scripture for another ark, but not nearly as massive as the one that Noah built. It's the, where is it, Isabel? You thought you had it? Who else was spared from the waters by an ark? Moses, that's right. But clarification, that ark didn't save Moses. You know it, God did. It's interesting. This idea that it's not about the, the thing, it's about God. The thing is just an agent that God uses to accomplish his will. 
The boat didn't save Noah. God did. God just used the boat to save Noah. Make sense? All right. So, that said, the boat was an important part of this story. God could have sent a flood, but parted the waters all around Noah for the year approximately that he was, he was, or the world was experiencing the flood. He could have kept Noah and his family dry and safe and protected. He could have done all sorts of other things, but instead God said, there has to be a boat involved. There has to be uh, an experience. There has to be this thing, and I'm not going to make it. I'm tired of creating stuff. Don't you see what I made? I made the universe. I made the animals. I made, I made everything. You can make a boat. Genesis 6.14, build a large boat, is how my translation puts it, from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out, then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Could God have just simply spoken that thing into existence? Sure could. Chose not to. Why? <laughs> this wasn't God needing years. This is Noah needing years. I'll note, by the way, uh, this translation, the New Living Translation, I don't like that, that uh, first sentence, build a large boat from cypress wood, because if anybody's ever seen the movie Evan Almighty, you might be familiar with the fact that it is gopher wood. <laughs> Anybody ever seen Evan Almighty? Okay. Some of you are almost ashamed to admit that you've seen it. That's okay. It's, it's the Noah story all over again, but without the rock monsters. Anyway, um, <laughs> one of the things that stood out to me about that story, though, is, of course, there's this famous sequence where he has to go through the process of building the boat because God drops off piles and piles of lumber that have been cut, prepared, and otherwise shipped to him and dropped off over the course of a handful of properties. And he has to then go through this montage of building the boat and all of the pain and all the suffering that goes with it. And it made me think, Evan, Steve Carell's character, got lucky. Because Noah didn't have Home Depot. <laughs> Noah didn't have power tools and instruction manuals. Know how to build an ark for dummies, like Evan did. But yet Noah still did everything exactly as God commanded him. Like I said, this was not an easy process. If you're reading through Ellen White's writings on uh, the commentary uh, of this journey in Patriots and Prophets, she says the building of this immense structure was a slow and laborious process. She says, on account of the great size of the trees and the nature of the wood, much more labor was required then than now to prepare the timber, even with the greater strength with which men possessed. I want you to picture this process. Wake up in the morning, we need wood. Can't grab your power saw, can't grab your chainsaw, grab an axe, go to the forest chop down a tree, strip out that tree, make it so you can move it, bring it to where you're building the boat, put all the wood in place, and repeat over and over and over again. When your muscles hurt, when you just wake up and don't feel like it. Good weather. I would say bad weather, but they didn't know what bad weather was, so they got, he was lucky on that one. Day after day, building the boat. I can only picture, by the way, that he did face obstacles from his neighbors. Because as his neighbors watched him day after day build a boat, I can't help but wonder if somebody walked along and said, what are you doing? building a boat, but there's no water here. There will be. Tree after tree, plank of wood after plank of wood, build a boat. And he did it exactly as God commanded. Now, it can be so easy to sit here and say, good job, Noah. 
Because of your faithful construction, this boat got built. Well done, Noah, because you didn't quit. You were able to build the, the vessel for your salvation. And as tempting as it is to celebrate the story of Noah for Noah's hard work and Noah's faithfulness and Noah's dedication, and to take a passage like we had in our scripture reading from Hebrews 11 was a part of the hall of faith. It can be so easy to look at Noah and say, Noah was such an awesome man. Look at everything Noah did to save Noah. We need to clarify, Noah didn't save Noah, right? God did. No amount of hard work is going to accomplish anything that Noah is trying to set, or has, has set off to do. This is entirely God's project. God's the one who gave him the strength in the first place. God's the one who put the wisdom into him. God's the one who gave him the instructions. It is God's project. He just happened to work through the vessel of Noah. Why did he work through Noah? Well, as a reminder, Noah's trying to build a boat, but God is trying to build something better. Day after day, even when he didn't feel like it, Noah built the boat because day after day, even when he didn't feel like it, Noah built his faith, or should I say God built Noah's faith. Through this journey, his muscles likely grew stronger, but along the way, not just his physical, but his spiritual, his trust in God likely grew stronger. And as I mentioned, people challenged him. He had chances to exercise his faith. Again, reading from Patriarchs and Prophets, while Noah was giving his warning message to the world, his works testified of his sincerity. It was thus that his faith was perfected and made evident. This process, one tree at a time, one lump piece, of, you know, one plank at a time, one hammer, one ugh, boo-boo at a time, one day at a time, one opportunity to witness at a time, his faith was being made perfect. And so I want to ask a simple question here. When you do your practices of faith, do you do them just for the sake of doing them? Or are they actually helping your faith and your trust in God? Think about some of the less labor-intensive faith practices that God has given to us, ways that he's told us, tools that he's put in our hands to know and to be stronger in our walk with him. They don't require us to knock down a tree. Some of them only require us to pick up our Bible and read it, drop to our knees and pray, take a little bit of time each week for him. And your neighbors will notice, your friends will notice, your family will notice, your uh, people around you will notice and they'll say, what are you doing? Connecting with God. And I've had people ask me, why? He's not here. I think he is, and I think he will be, right? And so it's easy to stand up here and to celebrate Noah for his faithfulness, Noah for all of his, his dedication, everything he did to become stronger in his physical self, stronger in his spiritual self, and ultimately the word is made perfected. But being perfected does not always necessarily mean perfect. Because in spite of that, my word is however here. That is that the story of Noah going onto the boat, being saved through the flood, coming out, and even the happily ever after that we get. He comes off the boat. He offers a sacrifice. He makes a covenant with God, or God, I should say, makes a covenant with him. And what is the sign of the covenant? The rainbow. That's right. And in here, the relationship that God makes, this partnership that he makes with Noah, the promise is, hey, Noah, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to destroy humanity with a flood anymore. It's interesting that God is the only one who takes on the terms of this relationship. Noah has no responsibility to this relationship other than don't do something stupid to get kicked or to take yourself out of the terms of this relationship. God's the one who makes all the promises. God's the one who puts all the conditions on himself. It's not about Noah, it's about God. All you have to do, Noah, is not do something stupid. And so what's the first thing that Noah does? 
something stupid. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 20. After the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground and he planted a vineyard. One day he drank some wine he had made and he became drunk and he lay naked inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw that his father was naked and went outside and told his brothers. And the way that, he, that God later reflects on the story, you can tell the implication. It isn't a concerned story that he's telling him. He is going out of his way to embarrass his dad, to make him ashamed for the choices that he's made. And it caught me this morning as I'm reading through. I couldn't help but notice The story last week of Adam and Eve is the story of two people who in a garden sinned and found themselves naked and ashamed. Noah now finds himself in a vineyard, which is a type of garden, and specifically here finds himself now, after his his shortcomings, finds himself naked and ashamed. Isn't it interesting? But check this out. Last week I told you with Adam and Eve, our take-home point, our big, big message is that Adam and Eve teach us, that teach us grace, judgment, and grace again. The story of Noah does the same thing. Grace, judgment, and grace again. Because God does not leave Noah in his shame. Shem and Japheth, his sons. They took a robe, they held it over their shoulders, and they backed into the tent to cover their father. As they did this, they looked the other way so that they would not see him naked. What do they become? Agents of grace. Just as Adam and Eve had to provide, have an alternative covering provided for them by another, God providing the animal skins for them, so too Shem and Japheth become agents of grace and provide a covering for their dad to cover him from his shame, from his embarrassment from his shortcomings and transgressions. Noah's story opens with grace, climaxes with grace, and ends with grace. And in fact, by the time the story is told again in the New Testament, once again where our scripture reading was, I can't help but notice. You know what it doesn't include? His shortcomings at all. We know the stories there. We know what happened in the vineyard. But when it's time for God to tell the story, that's not the thing that caught God's attention. Because grace has covered that part. So in Hebrews eleven seven, 7, we are told it is by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about the things that never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. And it can be so tempting once again to just sort of isolate this and boil it down to simple that it's all about the ark. And I kind of laughed that the goal here, you notice that he condemns the world, but that I would, I would say is not the intention. Because if God's intention is to condemn the world, and the whole point of the flood is just to wipe out the world, and we're only going to save Noah, because only Noah found grace, or Noah and his family found grace, God didn't need to have Noah build an ark. He needed a pontoon. But he built something absolutely massive. Have you seen the replica over in Kentucky? Some of you have seen it. It's been estimated that if they got the seating and some various structures and platforms right, it could hold 125,000 people. That's basically the populations of Casper and Cheyenne put together. Or I'll just say two Caspers because I... Cheyenne. Um, (laughs) They're on their own. Um, (laughs) God had something much bigger in mind, and honestly, it makes me think about New Jerusalem. How big is New Jerusalem? Spoken of in the book of Revelation, 1,400 miles one way, and then 1,400 miles another way, and 1,400 miles another way. And my takeaway when we talked about it with Revelation last fall was to simply say, that is an awfully big city to be empty. 
It would be so easy to simply point out that Noah condemned the world. But the condemnation wasn't Noah saying, you sinners have to stay out because his goal was to have an open door. His goal was to invite people to come in. His faith testified. Unfortunately, it is on the other people that they didn't listen. But that's their story. We're talking about Noah today. So here we go. Noah was trying to build a boat, and I said that God wanted to build something better. God used the ark to save Noah and his family in more than one way. Not just from the flood, but perhaps through the process, one day at a time, one board at a time, one tree at a time, becoming stronger. During these experiences, Noah had the chance to become stronger physically and spiritually. He learned how to trust, how to obey, how to witness, and more. And so my question today as we apply this story is to simply ask, what boat is God having you build? What boat has God put on your heart? What journey has God taken you on that admittedly sometimes makes no sense to anybody else except to say, God said do it? How is God making you stronger through your journey? One day at a time, one patient at a time, One snowy Casper winter at a time. (laughs) These all add up, don't they? Think about the journey that Noah had to go through one board at a time. How many stories, how many opportunities to become stronger? How many reasons does he have to give thanks to God? How many things have you gone through as a chance to strengthen your faith? One homework assignment at a time, one restless night at a time, one how am I going to pay this bill at a time, and yet God comes through. All of these reasons, adding up, building a plank, building that boat, making you stronger, but revealing him. Him. 